together. Good morning. <laughs> um, and it is a good morning. And the sunshine is shining bright in this room. <laughs> it's wonderful to be home. I got in late last night. And it's great to be at McAllister College after a very long weekend and a uh, weekend in, in D.C. Uh, it's, it's just really great to see your faces here. So uh, I would like to take a second, though, however, and thank McAllister for providing us this wonderful venue uh, this morning's meetings. I have to say, they're amazing hosts. They go way out of the way to make sure that everybody's comfortable, everything's going to work well. So let's give a hand to the McAllister staff. Um, and as I said, it's a, it's a good morning for Americans and uh, people here in Minnesota. And I'm just going to take a, a few minutes to kind of set, set up um, what happened and uh, talk about some of the issues that still are confronting our nation. And then I want to hear your ideas and your opinions and hear your questions. So if you think about it, our nation faces very serious challenges. In fact, it's actually stunting to think about the challenges we face. The economy, health care, the environment, education, income disparity, racial inequality, racial inequality, immigration, we've got an open seat on the Supreme Court, conflicts in the Middle East, North Korea with nuclear weapons, Russian hacking, and the attack, and their deliberate attack to influence the outcome of the presidential election. And all of these challenges, and Donald Trump now is the President of the United States, and the Republicans control both the U.S. House and Senate. So there are the individuals leading this nation, the President, the Speaker of the House, and the Senate Majority Leader. And they're trying to take this nation into a place in which our country will no longer be recognizable whether it's Trump's executive orders to ban refugees, immigrants, and Muslims, or whether it's building a complete, unnecessary wall on the Mexican border, or whether it's sending more troops into Syria, whether it's withdrawing the United States from the climate change agreements, or whether it's repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. We need to stand strong. And we need to use every lever of power at our disposal to stop the White House and the Republican Congress. We need to work together. Local, state, federal elected leaders need to work together. We need to use the courts. We need to use the power of the people as what has happened in the past couple weeks. We need people to be active, engaged. Citizens who will stand up, and speak out, and demand action. But we also need business leaders, civic leaders, leaders of faith to speak up for what is right, the values of America, the values that we all share that keep this country strong. We want America we can recognize. Late yesterday afternoon, Speaker Ryan and President Trump made a decision to forego a vote on their terrible health care bill, and they pulled it from the House floor. Now, that was a victory. and it was a victory for all of us. The credit for this victory, and I can't be more clear about this, it belongs to you. The citizens, the millions and millions of citizens, because of their engagement, their mobilization, and their determination created an avalanche of opposition to the Republican Trump health care bill. talking to my colleagues and I even answered some of the phone calls. Thank you. <laughs> Yesterday's results were a testament of what can happen when citizens are active and engaged in fighting for their interests, their neighbors, and our country. My constituents here in the 4th District shared very personal stories with me about problems that they had faced, issues they were concerned about, and there's nothing more personal than your health. And they shared their heartfelt opinions. And for that, I thank you for sharing 
those very intimate parts of your life with me. In return, you have supported me 100%, not just in opposing this bad bill, but you've supported me in fighting to make health care a right for all Americans, a human right. because of your engagement, major health care associations knew that they had to stand up and they had to oppose this bill. Thousands of advocacy groups, nonprofits, unions, and faith groups stood up and they opposed this bill. And every single Democrat in the House opposed this bill. And I also want to share with you, there are some very good people on the Republican side and they said no, that this was a bad bill and they were not the Freedom Caucus. <laughs> one of them, he truly is a friend of mine, Charlie Demp, who served on the Appropriations Committee. He's a Republican from Pennsylvania, and I quote what Charlie said, I will, what will happen with uh, Trump here, it will lead to the loss of coverage and make insurance unaffordable for too many Americans, particularly low to moderate income and older individuals, end of quote. There were people on the other side who felt empowered because of what was happening in their districts to stand up and speak out against this terrible bill. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office evaluated this bill, and it, re it would report 24 million Americans would lose coverage in the next de decade. 14 million just in the first year. And that would have included 53,000 people here in the 4th District. The other issue of great concern to all of us was the block granting of Medicaid to states that would result in the rationing of health care to individuals with disabilities, children, and seniors, our most vulnerable populations. What was very shocking, I think, and finally became very much exposed in the last couple days, is this bill was filled with massive tax cuts to corporations, to millionaires, and billionaires. And if you can imagine this, 400 of the wealthiest families in America each would have received a $7 million tax cut in the Republican bill. <coughs> 24 million Americans lose health care coverage. 400 of the wealthiest receive a $7 million tax cut. And for older Americans in particular, it would allow them to be charged 500% more for their policies, more than younger Americans, five times more. And older Americans are on fixed incomes. For example, a 64-year-old under the Republican bill would have had an out-of-pocket increase of $12,900 in the individual market. It's outrageous, right? So let's be honest. More than a handful of Republicans opposed the bill because it didn't go far enough. Charlie Dent was one of the few who said it went too far. But a handful of Republicans opposed the bill because that bill did not go far enough. They wanted more. Forcing work requirements on Medicaid recipients. Eliminating essential benefit coverage for maternity, well baby checks, or preventative screening. That wasn't enough for them. So I want to say again, yesterday we had a victory, but the Affordable Care Act is not safe. We need to fully expect this White House and the Republican Congress to sabotage the ACA using executive orders, rule changes, and budget processes that lever, they'll use any lever of power that they can, that does not require a vote in public. So our work is not done. And as I uh, shared with a few people when I walked in, President Trump has said he will wait until the ACA implodes or collapses, harming millions of Americans, rather than working with Democrats to reform, to improve, and to strengthen this law. I find that profoundly disturbing. We should not play political games with people's lives. And I want you to know I will not tolerate this dangerous, repulsive attitude from the White House. I want to work. I want to work. 
idea. But when you know it needs a little repair, it needs some improvement, and we need to strengthen it. So stay tuned, and I will be calling upon your help in the future to protect the Affordable Care Act. But I want to take a few minutes to discuss some of the other proposals President Buck, uh, Trump has put forward in the 2018 fiscal year federal budget. Now remember, the President proposes and the Congress disposes. But what Trump put forward is radical, it's harmful, and that too needs to be rejected. As a lead Democrat on the Interior and Environment Appropriations Committee, my Republican chairman and I need to produce a bill to fund about $32 billion in annual spending for the Environmental Protection Agency and the Interior Department and about a dozen other smaller agencies. But after putting climate change denier as the head of the agency, Mr. Trump has proposed of cutting the EPA's budget by 31,000, excuse me, 31%, terminating 3,000 employees. 31% cut, 3,000 employees. So their plan is to put the polluters in charge of environmental protection, which puts our air and our water and our land at risk, along with our collective health. Now, my subcommittee is also responsible for the arts and the humanities. The National Endowment for the Arts and the Humanities are eliminated under Trump's budget. That's right, zero. But that's just the start. Low-income heating programs, which have about uh, 340,000 Minnesotans, mostly low-income seniors and people with disabilities, eliminated. Community development block grants, which are essential to St. Paul and cities all across Minnesota, eliminated. AmeriCorps, Conservation Corps, Senior Corps, eliminated. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting, eliminated. The Institutes of Health get slashed by $6 billion. The Great Lakes Restoration Program, eliminated. Housing, public education, and rural development, slash. And then think about this. Investments in diplomacy, international development, food aid, humanitarian aid, global health, United Nations, all the soft power elements that American global leadership needs gets cut by $11 billion. In return, Trump proposes $2.6 billion to start building a wall on the border with Mexico. But it gets worse. The Pentagon would get an increase of $54 billion for a total in their budget of $600 billion. Now, I believe this is outrageous. And it takes our nation to a place of greater militarization at the expense of domestic needs of every family in this room and all across the country. It hurts our communities, our main streets, our businesses, and our nonprofits. So, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, it's my job to make smart, sound, sustainable investments that allow the federal government to meet the needs of the American people. That's my job. Every problem facing this nation does not require a military solution <coughs> to make us safer and stronger. I think we can agree in this room that good schools, a clean environment, a growing economy, and quality health care make our families and communities safe and strong, too. Think about it. We can't fight AIDS or phantom or climate change with bombs and bullets. We need American leadership. We need smart power. We need a commitment of a generous nation. And with our military power, we must be mindful that it be used with restraint and respect. 
I want you to know that I'm very concerned about the expanded military presence of our troops in Syria and Iraq. The news that U.S. forces may have killed over 200 civilians in Mosul, in Iraq, is shocking. <coughs> Reports follow of drone strikes killing scores of civilians in Syria. We need an effective, professional military, but we cannot be providing the Pentagon with blank checks for their budget and their ever-expanding conflicts. To me, that's just unacceptable, and we need to do congressional oversight, and we need to put a check and a balance on the military. I'm going to touch on one last question, uh, issue, and then I'm going to take questions. And there were, you, you, I mentioned the other things because in, in light of what was going on with the Affordable Care Act, you didn't hear about much else in the news, except maybe one other issue. Never in my wildest dreams would I imagine Congress needing to grapple with a matter so as unsettling as to whether or not our President Donald Trump and his campaign collaborated with Russia in their efforts to influence the 2016 presidential election. The whole issue is just stunning to me, but it is of the most great consequence to our nation and our democracy. Let's be clear. The Russians hacked and attacked our election. And that's a fact. There is no way this Republican-controlled Congress can lead an impartial, honest investigation into the Trump ties with Russia. We need... special prosecutor to be appointed to investigate possible criminal activity. <laughs> we not only need, we deserve a bipartisan independent commission to establish to investigate Russia's cyber attacks and our vulnerabilities and the steps that we need to take to make sure our democracy here at home is protected. We were attacked by a foreign adversary. And that demands an absolute, full, independent, transparent investigation, regardless of where the facts lead. <laughs> I want to thank you for, uh, for being here today. I do want to uh, make sure that we were respectful of time and that people have a chance to share opinions and concerns. Some people feel uncomfortable standing up in a microphone and, and having things recorded. I, I appreciate that. We have comment sheets. Please feel free to email, call, and contact our office. And we stand um, ready to help you. Um, with that, we have two microphones on the side. We have a few um, individuals who might not um, be comfortable or physically uh, able to easily reach the microphones. If they have a question, if they would please raise their hand now so my staff can identify who they are. We had some at the other one. People who are, um, might need assistance getting to a microphone or having a microphone be brought to them. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to alternate microphones one at a time. And um, this is something when I hear things going, at people's town hall meetings and people say what happened. I said, oh, that doesn't happen in the fourth district. Everybody is respectful of everybody's opinion. Everybody is kind and, 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 and courteous. And I just have the best darn people in the whole United States at my town hall meeting. So I'm, uh, I'm ready to start with questions. So one thing we do ask is maybe just your first name and the city in which you live in. And Let's see, you pledge allegiance with your right hand, so I'm going to start with a flag on this side. How's that? Um, thank you so much, Representative McCollum. My name is Kava Zabawa, and I live in the St. Croix River Valley area in Lakeland Shores, Minnesota. And I want to let you know that the people, the citizens in uh, St. Croix Valley are organizing. A lot of women, a lot of citizens. We're organizing around our issues that are important to us. Um, my passion is healthcare, and um, 
And I'm, um, we're very interested in the constituents in our area are very interested in working with your staff to, um, to work towards a healthcare system that is a human right and not a commodity. So that's more than repairing the Affordable Care Act, in our opinion. So would you, um, uh, we invite you, we, we're having, we're, we are gonna have a meeting with your team, but we would like to engage with you about talking about what, what a true healthcare system in the United States would, would be for our citizens. So I invite you. Well, thank you, and, and you have been, your, your group has been very thoughtful and very organized in contacting We've been working with my district director, uh, Mr. Straka. We, we appreciate that, um, and we are working on a date that fits into our mutual schedules. I don't control my schedule as much as I would like to think I have a date. And uh, so, so, to the best of our ability, we will be working together. Thank you so much, and thank you for gathering a group of people together. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Alan Malkus. I live about a mile from here in the uh, Summitville area. I want to thank you for all the progressive positions you've taken for your strong stand on uh, opposing Trump care. And given the realities of politics in this country where people tend to be sort of lumped into districts where everybody agrees with one another, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, what can we do? We know we don't have to pressure you a whole lot to take the right position. What can we do to influence those other representatives in other areas, maybe like your friend in Pennsylvania, who are in districts where maybe they can push to do the right thing? What can I do in my friend? I get to make a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm, I'm limited as to what I can say because we're here as an official town hall. And I have another part of my job that I do where I have rallies. So this is a town hall. But what you can do as a citizen is what the people here in the 4th District uh, did. They shared their stories, um, so sharing stories, um, made phone calls, um, and engaged uh, district offices in a respectful way so that, you know, at a district office we're working on veterans issues and, um, you know, Medicare, health and passports and other things like that. But people uh, engage district offices by inviting, um, setting up uh, meet and greets and, and things like that for either the district director or for the um, representative to go to. So a contact works. Yesterday was because people contacted their official offices. And I have to tell you, the phone calls were, you know, amazing. And I was able to talk, to, when, when I knew that that bill was at 17% support, I felt pretty confident walking up to one of my colleagues saying, oh, my phone calls are, you know, well over 100 to 1 or, you know, 150 to 1 after yesterday against this. How are your phones going? Oh, I'm getting calls. <laughs> so the phone calls work. The phone calls work. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Hi, my name is Amy. Hi, Amy. I live in St. Paul. And my question is actually is sort of about the Trump Russia story that you touched on a little bit. Um, so, and I saw on the Facebook page that you support both the select committee and a special commission to get to the bottom of this story. Um, but from what we understand, a special commission to investigate Trump's ties with Russia, while <coughs> useful, will look at the whole sort of quagmire and may take sort of years to get to, to get to the bottom of it. And I believe that the American people need answers now. And we're wondering what can you do to demand a special prosecutor to investigate this? You mentioned that, and I'm just wondering what steps need to be taken for that to happen. And can we hear about that more? Because we haven't heard about that a lot in the media lately. We've heard a lot about the special commission, a lot about a select committee, but what about a special prosecutor? So we're having a bit of a tug of war. That's a great question, Annie. We're having a bit of a tug of war right now in the intelligence committee. There's a few committees, there aren't many, where we really, um, you know, try to work uh, in the public and sometimes, you know, with each other one to one to put partisanship down and move America forward. One of them is the Appropriations Committee, um, and then the other one, uh, 
not so much ways and means anymore, but in the past they've been that way. But the other place has always been the Intelligence Committee. And um, that blew up this week. <coughs> and the, uh, Adam Schiff, who's my class, he came into Congress with me. I know Adam really well. What a smart guy. Great. Smart guy. He, he's, uh, he's trying to see if we can you know, corral the horses back in. <laughs> And then Mr. Nunes went off and was meeting again yesterday. So that's what that's going to be our problem in the House because we don't control the committees and and so therefore we don't control the agenda. I think you're going to see some uh, privileged resolutions to the floor. We've done that in ways and means to try to get the, the taxes out. I think we're going to see some other privileged resolutions come to the floor where we keep it up in the public, hoping that the public does something similar as it did with the Affordable Care Act. Um, I think the Senate actually, yeah, they can, um, and they're very involved in this report right now. The Senate's talking about maybe moving on something faster. It was the Senate that moved faster on Watergate than the House did. And, uh, and so we're, we're saying we're open to everything. I think everything needs to happen. So we're just putting the pressure on it here again where I can say, if we know the phone calls are happening and that America's demanding an investigation, I can do the same thing I did on the Affordable Care Act with one of my colleagues from Iowa that was in the elevator with and saying, and how are those phone calls going? <laughs> so I really think a lot of it is going to be us keeping the pressure on myself, but also your work with people all across the United States through social media keeping the pressure on. I also read about this um, reauthorization of the Ethics in Government Act, which was brought up, I guess, during the, the re brought up again during the Clinton era, and whether that's something that the House could think about doing. Well, the House to appoint a special prosecutor. I can think about that, but I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not powerless. I can still speak up. I can still speak out. I can still be a person who's, you know, demanding, demanding justice. A person who demands, you know, the facts be faced and the truth come out. But um, we can't alone unless we were able to get enough uh, moderate, Demo uh, moderate Republicans to get uh, to, to get it because we don't schedule what comes up on the floor. So when I talk about these privileges, this is more in the weeds. I'm a social studies teacher. You made me so happy. <laughs> um, so, so a privileged resolution is something that you know we take turns um, going down to the floor and saying we demand that this be brought up, and then the speaker says, well, we have to wait 24 hours for it to ripen, and then we come back 24 hours later and we go, we demand this be brought up, and then and the speaker makes a motion to table. <laughs> but we're doing that. We're using everything in our toolbox. So thank you very much for the question. Hello, Betty. Joel. Uh, my name is Joel, in case you didn't hear that. <laughs> Betty and I have door knocked, and I think she knows what I'm going to say. I'd like to um, hear a little more about where you think we're going long term with the health care issue. Uh, we absolutely needed to defeat Trump Care, and thank you very much for your work on that. Uh, we absolutely need to make Obamacare as, as, as it can be as long as we have it. But it still begs the question, where are we going overall? And in order to get that conversation started with you, I'd like to suggest an answer. <laughs> and, I, I know the question. You're going you're gonna to hear us have our, our rhetorical conversation. <laughs> so we're all playing roles. So uh, <laughs> there is a bill, as you know, in Congress that's submitted annually by John Conyers called the Improved uh, Medicare for All Act, H.R. Uh, 676. How, uh, and just for fun, how many people in the room think that the answer to health care is universal health care based on So let's admit that if you know we took a vote on John Conyers' bill, it would be defeated right now. <laughs> However, can we walk and chew gum? Uh, can we can we uh, push bills like that forward and still try to do as best as we can short term? So again, to I'd like to hear a little more about the long term solution. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And then, and um, you know a lot of people uh, were were. Uh, 
when they used to pull on the Affordable Care Act and ask people how they liked it, and then they'd say, oh, you know, 50, 40% of Americans don't like it. They never took out the part of Americans who wanted to move forward, like on a Conyers proposal for Medicare for all, or single payer. So when you took those folks out, it kind of shifted them over with, the, they lean towards liking the Affordable Care Act better than they do the, the status quo. Um, you know, we had broad support of the American people. Well, I think you saw what happened yesterday. And I think you saw the direction that the Republicans want to take Medicare. Um, they're talking about, you know, uh, increasing premiums for seniors 64 and that, not, not protecting our seniors even on Medicare. And then you think about what they wanted to do with Medicaid with the block grants. And so let me just explain to you how the block grants would have worked. So and there were two different proposals out there, but I'll just talk about one if you want to look good. The state of Minnesota would get a set amount of money for um, you know, Medicaid for, and that's, that's children, people with disabilities, seniors. And if something, um, once that, that block of money is set, would it keep up with inflation? Would it keep up with changing demographics in states? And would it keep up with the cost of medicine? You know, we, we've seen what happens with prescription drugs and other things. So it's a fixed amount. And once that fixed amount is spent, they're done. And so they have something like this in Indian country that we've been trying to undo bipartisan, I might add, where the, the Native Americans actually had a term for their health care. It was don't get sick after August because the money's all gone. <laughs> So um, that's what we're up against right now, people trying to cut the benefits set under it, trying to um, uh, cap it, and people who, in Congress and the Freedom and Tea Party, who don't even think it belongs there. So we have to keep talking about the ideal that Joel brought up that all of you raised your hands for. And that's why I have a bill that says health care is a right, it is a human right. And if we can get to having folks realize that in Congress, I think the next step becomes very clear in the direction our health care needs to go, which is to be universal. So keep the letters coming, keep, keep talking to people about it. We can't be silent about, about what we think is the ultimate goal, but in the meantime, we have to protect and build on what we have and not give up what we have because it isn't the perfect that we want. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for all your hard work. My name is Karen Hansen, and I live in St. Paul here. Um, my kids attend a public school, a great public school in St. Paul. We had off yesterday for conferences, and Amy kind of addressed my concern. Um, we went over to the Riverview Theater, and. Um, in Minneapolis, and with your ticket stub, you can go over to Northern Sun on Lake Street, <laughs> and you can get a free bumper sticker. And I just have to point out that I love the arts, I love artists, and it's amazing what they can come up with. <laughs> this is one of them, this is what I picked up. So my question for you, <laughs> my question for you is, with um, Russia, um, you said um, there needs to be an independent, independent investigation, and then are you requesting that Devin Nunes recuses himself from, from the investigation, or...? Um... So, like I said, Adam, Adam is really, really super bright, and Adam's working this, and I told Adam I would back him up, whatever he wanted to do. He was having some conversations, and he talks to um, all kinds of folks, not only people on the Intelligence Committee, but he's speaking to leadership on both, both sides about what the next step should be. So I look forward to talking to Adam on uh, Tuesday to hear what, um, where they think they're going to go. The, the, the Democrats on the Intel Committee are taking this extraordinarily, uh, and you know, they're, they're outraged um, by, by these you know, things that 
when this is done. I mean, it's just unheard of. And the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee bipartisan, they're very, they're very upset by it because there, there's just a couple of places where America needs to know we work together, right? And that is making sure that we're all going to make sure that we keep America safe from, from attacks, Thank you. cyber included. I have another quick um, just comment. You mentioned the military, and I just, as my personal experience, um, just don't, don't know if everybody remembers in 2010, actually, um, Congress did approve the military, U.S. Navy, to buy 10 um, littoral combat ships, and that was increased to 20. Two areas got contracts for that. 10 were awarded, I think, to Mobile, Alabama, and 10 um, were awarded to Marinette Marine in Wisconsin. My brother actually is working on those ships. So I think our military has been sufficiently funded. Each of those ships cost $480 million. And um, yes, um, thank you for your work on that. Too. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Hang on your bumper stick for people who are on Good morning. Hi, I'm David Harrington. Um, my wife and I are self-employed, and so our family relies on insure for our health insurance. Since 2014, our premiums have tripled. In um, two, 2017 alone, our premiums went up 62%, and this forced us to purchase a lower cost plan with a deductible that was twice as high as our deductible in 2016. So I'm a proponent of the ACA, and now that it will be in place for the foreseeable future, <laughs> um, I think it needs to be fixed. and. Um, I'm concerned that if our premiums keep going up, that um, it'll no longer be worth it for me to stay in business as uh, I'm a remodeling contractor. Um, you know, if I get another 62% increase next year, I will really think hard about going to work for somebody else who has the benefits. Um, so currently I spend about 15% of my income on my premiums. And, and that, um, that doesn't include the co-pays, the prescriptions, and the deductibles. So I'm kind of afraid that uh, Trump might be right that this might explode. Um, so what I'm asking from you and your colleagues is to bring legislation now. Sorry, can I get this? <laughs> might be a contract. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> it's Trump calling on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm asking from your colleagues is that you bring legislation and work with the new administration to, um, to help, help offset these rises. Um, whatever, whatever that might be, um, you know, working across state lines, um, you know, letting us buy into the government um, programs and um, whatever else you can think of. Um, you know, ultimately, I'd like to see a, a single payer universal health care. Um, so, that's my comment. Okay, well, part of the Affordable Care Act. Would, you know, could, could start businesses, and we saw, we saw a flourishment of that. Part of the reason why um, the premiums and everything have gone up is there's been how many votes to repeal, you know, over 50 votes to repeal, and we've been, we've been saying since day one we need to do reinsurance, we need to look at a public option, we, we have, we have a, a list of things out there that we think that, that can tamp down the pressure. Um, but the, one of the other shocking things um, is that even without the Affordable Care Act being there, there are um, independent studies that show you that your insurance rates even would have gone up higher, which means people wouldn't have insurance. So we need to come up with, um, with a solution on how to stabilize and, and, and get it mobilized. So my hope is now that um, some of the um, moderate Republicans have been out there, um, there's a couple of groups out there that are ready to kind of sit down and but then we have to let Paul Ryan, Speaker Ryan, allow us to bring something to the floor for a vote. 
And um, so here again, if we can, and, and it's my hope, my wish, and my hard work to do this, is to uh, come up with uh, a couple of quick things that we can do that maybe we just go straight straight to the administration, as you point out. Because um, Mr. Trump said, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> and I think he found out it was. But he also, he also, I think, in this debate, started finding out how many of the people who, who very sincerely supported him, and I, and I mean this with, with respect to those people who casted their vote, um, didn't think that Meals on Wheels and um, that they were going to lose their health insurance. And so those people have been mobilized and engaged. So I think we might have an opportunity if we can get the White House to focus on it. But we need, you know, when we did the Affordable Care Act, we took Republican amendments. We were taking amendments on the floor. We, we spent over a year working on it. We had all kinds of public hearings where people from the public came and testified. When this bill that was pulled from the floor yesterday had not one public hearing and did not rule in order one Democratic amendment, and so I think that's what finally kind of started getting some of the loud Republicans like, no, 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 that's not how democracy works. So you have my pledge to work really, really hard for you. And if you have any questions or if there's anything you want us to, to look at in the meantime, please contact my office and we stand ready to assist you however we can. Thanks. Can Good luck. Thank you. To add one more, one more thing. Um, I dragged my kids here kicking and screaming. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, "I'm not kicking or screaming anymore." <laughs> they said, "Why do we have to come? This doesn't even—it doesn't affect me at all." Oh. So, would you? Would you? Um, <laughs> Um, I and my coworkers and scientists I know across the country are really terrified that science has become a partisan issue. And I want to know what you and your colleagues, and especially any, any colleagues and relationships you have across the aisle, what you are doing to try to make science protected, safe, and nonpartisan. Love science, but not a scientist. Thank you for what you what you do. Thank you for being here today, because there are so many other issues that are being overshadowed, and that that's that's been my my fear, and why I took a few minutes in my comments to talk about some of the other important issues and cuts um, moving forward. I have a bill because, as I mentioned earlier, I have uh, the EPA, I have the Department of Interior, and in kind of what I'm. In chart tasked with, with, with protecting that we make smart investments with. And after the Trump administration went in, and it's no secret now, the Heritage Foundation came in with all their list of cuts for research and to cut climate change uh, research and all that. I became alarmed when I started hearing scientists such as yourself who had been working in things in the public realm that could go about public were putting things on the internet, encouraging other scientists just to download them to keep them safe. So I introduced a bill that's called Keep Our Science <laughs> and Keep Our Research. And uh, it is saying that the federal government cannot, cannot destroy or not make public things that you collectively, through your tax dollars, have been supporting such as the work you've been doing in rediction and recovery. And you're right, this, uh, just what you're working on alone is a huge crisis. 
and that was one of the tipping points when this, this planned benefit set that, uh, that the Republicans uh, were eliminating in health care. Well, part of a planned benefit set that they, that they thought should be optional in insurance is uh, for addiction and recovery and mental health. Because sometimes people start onto the road of uh, addiction because they're self-medicating. They're, they're, they're trying to treat what's, what's wrong with them and they can use something for a little bit and makes it go away and they think, oh, I've, I've got this under control and then it spins out of control and their lives are just devastated and everyone around them. So um, we, we, we raise that and there are there are places all across the country, it doesn't make any sense whether it's a red spot or a blue spot, purple spot, green spot, yellow spot. There, there is a crisis with opioid and heroin addiction and, and, and alcohol continues to be um, you know, an addiction that, that we aren't as a nation really comfortable addressing um, because it's legal. Um, so the work that you do becomes very, very important and it has to be funded because you're going to save not only lives, you're going to save money in the long run, right? So an investment in you is not only uh, an investment in stabilizing a family, it's an investment in spending less dollars in the future. So thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, you have my, my, uh, my commitment not to let those cuts go through to the National Institute of Health. Thank you so much. looking at a cut too, and that is the CDC, who then takes a lot of the recommendations um, and a lot of the, the great ideas and, and, and proven pilots and methods, and then the CDC, they're looking at a cut as well in their, in their dependency chemical community outreach. Hi, my name is Sarah, and uh, I'm a chemist, and I'm pleased to have been uh, upstaged by another scientist. Oh, so that's that's great. Great. That's never happened. A scientist. <laughs> it's chemistry. Women have. Yes, Sarah. So uh, I have, for the last 12 years, served on a national policy committee with the American Chemical Society, and we've been to your office and many other offices. You know, advocating. Every year we have a budget policy, you know, recommendation for all of the agencies. Uh, this includes a lot of things that people don't think about, like NIST and the Office of Science at DOE, I and mean, the health stuff is always a general crowd pleaser, but there's a whole bunch of other appropriations pieces that keep the science enterprise running. So uh, thank you for the question to my, to my friend, uh, the answer to her question, that was very helpful. My question for you is, sh as an appropriator, should we, with, with these crazy cuts that are, are not just should we fund at this level or that level, that are just flat out eliminating things. Should we be approaching Congress members with more detail, or should we be like about the impact, or should we be talking at a higher level about just maintaining the enterprise as it is? Because it's it's kind of an overwhelming situation, and I. As I advise my colleagues, my fellow scientists, my fellow ACS members about what's the most effective way to talk to their congressperson, it feels like we need to shake up our strategy because we're facing a fundamentally different um, problem. That's a really good question, and, it's, and, and people are starting to talk about it now that the president's skinny budget came out with you know the big cuts that I mentioned, like the arts and public broadcasting and Great Lakes, which is you know science-based and, and that. Um, so how many of you think we should do research and do regulatory and work with the industry to do oversight on chemicals that get in our air, water, and <laughs> so we passed a bill, and this gets to Sarah's point, we passed a bill, it's called TOSCA, and I won't get into the, the whole acronym of it. Very, very important bill. The ACS worked very hard with you guys on this. And, and so it's authorized. So we said that the EPA and industry finally came on board on this. I mean, this, you folks did an amazing job. It wasn't Congress, it was, it was 
scientists and, and, and responsible <coughs> business people and a whole host of folks who really and just really worked hard on this. Working with the states and the pollution control agencies and it was it was amazing work. It's a really good bill and it's authorized. But the, uh, the, the chemical industry part of it, you know, you're, you're, the, you're the science and, the, and the, the worker bees, and then, you know, the, they came in and they said, you know, we've got this amazing law, but if it's not funded, it's not going to do any good for all the, all the work that we did, and there's work that needs to be done. The EPA needs to have funds to do oversight and write the rules and do to the regulations. And um, so how do we get that message out? I think I think um, I, I think what I heard from them is they were going to go back and put the coalition together that got the good result to get the legislation authorized and say now we have to work together to get it funded. And I've already made it very clear to the Republicans, both in the House and in the Senate, there is a very important work that the EPA does for our air, for our water, for our public health, which is part of what TASCA focuses on. And I'm not backing down on that. I'm not going backwards. I'm only going to go forwards. And I think we can put together a coalition to at least um, raise that up. But we have to move immediately. These, these budget bills um, you know, are either going to happen with these huge cuts really fast overnight, or we're going to watch Congress, the inability to do their job, uh, and to kind of continue limping along with what you hear of these CRs every once in a while. And then that doesn't get the innovation and the stabilization that, that you need as American citizens, but that our business and our scientists need to move forward. So, um, Sarah, I know you know how to get a hold of us, and let's, let's talk more about how we can work together uh, in Washington, but also how we can raise the awareness here at home. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be briefer with my answers. I want to be respectful for people's time. I want to check with McAllister. Can, do I have maybe an additional 20 minutes? OK. Let's hear it from McAllister. <laughs> so, so the people that are online, if we could maybe um, have two of you uh, do, to pair up with your questions, that'll make me stop going into teacher mode. And, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm maybe not going to explain things in, in as much detail as I would love to, but maybe you don't want me to. Um, so, please, if we could have the two questions, and I'll do the same thing over here. Uh, my name is Frank. I'm, I'm retired. I live in St. St. Paul. I came here uh, recently from uh, Michigan, actually. Um, I was pleased with yesterday's result. wasn't expecting it, quite frankly, on the... Uh, you need to get closer to the microphone, Frank. Okay, sure. Um, on the American Health Care Act. Um, and I, I guess what I didn't appreciate is how, how much the Koch brothers uh, support the Freedom Caucus and allow them to uh, do things like that. I mean, they've, they've actually uh, told them that they will, fu they will fund them against any primary challenge. So, you know, that, that these people sort of feel like they have a free ride with what, what they're doing. But that aside, um, I'm concerned how, how much bad faith the administration has towards uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, as you indicated, in terms of sabotage. They, had, they did that from the outset. They refused to, uh, they, they withdrew the funding for the, uh, the last period uh, for joining in 2017, right. lowering the numbers. They told the IRS, don't enforce the penalty. Um, you can be sure they're going to be putting their thumbs on the scale going forward, especially with Dr. Price in charge of HHS. Um, I, what I, I guess what I'd like to urge is some kind of com joint, uh, uh, consistent effort, you know, maybe Obamacare angels, if you like, who are, are really collecting material. I mean, in all places, in, in, in the government, in HHS, 
uh, in some he uh, health care uh, 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 insurance agencies like Olena Care in California mm -hmm. uh, who might hear of things. But I, I think they're, they're going to claim that Obamacare collapsed in its own weight, and in fact, a good part of that weight is going to be their doing. And I think we have to be ready to make that argument. Okay, thank you. Sir? Yeah, good morning. My name is uh, Chuck Sawyer, and I'm a chiropractic doctor here in St. Paul, actually within walking distance of McAllister. And I'm the, uh, uh, currently the president of the Minnesota chapter of Physicians for National Health Program. So I, I know you get it. <laughs> I just, just want to add just one little other piece of information. And our organization, you know, two things, our organization is clearly, clearly supportive of fixing an already good, massive piece of legislation that needs to be tweaked, <clears throat> just like Medicare, you know, uh, from 1974 on. <clears throat> but in Minnesota, and sometimes you just have to kind of call out some kind of wacky things. <clears throat> in Minnesota, our legislature recently passed on the House side a $385 million <clears throat> funding package, basically that would provide insurance for insurance companies in Minnesota. <clears throat> and the author of that bill in the, in the House, who was quoted in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, that went something like, we have no idea what we just did. <laughs> the Senate passed a $600 million version of that, <clears throat> and that's to support 5% of the market. So with all due respect to the gentleman that spoke earlier who's in that 5%, right. <clears throat> uh, and even if we can fix the Affordable Care Act, the better solution clearly is to extend Medicare for everybody. <clears throat> uh, I, at the youthful age of 67, I found it incredibly easy to not shop for insurance, but to simply log on to a website. Ten minutes, the card came in the mail like three weeks later, and I'm in. Very good. Very good. So, we need more due diligence about, about the, the, the death by a thousand cuts. And if we can get that information out in a timely fashion, you have it. You're empowered to share it with people. It will. Um, it, will be able to put a bright light on, on what, what they're doing and, I, and hopefully embarrass them enough to stop and get them to the table to do what we need to do. Thank you both. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm from St. Paul. And I think a lot of what we're focusing on health care science, it all relies on you know freedom from oligarchs or the Mercers or billionaires running our political system. And I'm wondering if we can support uh, and start publicly financed elections and just full disclosure of all funding that goes into anyone's campaign. Hi, Congresswoman. My name is Peter Bornstein. I live in North Oaks. I'm here with my brilliant wife, who's a recently retired school nurse. I'm a physician. care of many of your constituents. And I'd just like to echo what Mr. Harrington said. I see a lot of people who are hurting under the Affordable Care Act. There are a lot of winners too, I must say. Most of my patients have done much better with the Affordable Care Act than without it, undoubtedly. But it needs a lot of fixing. And my plea to you is to work across the aisle with congressmen and other people. Please, please build a coalition Go back to Leader Pelosi, go back to Speaker with Ryan, say we have votes to improve the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. Yes, I can agree with you more. So I want to touch on the campaign finance um, uh, portion of this. When I first ran and what made me feel comfortable and able to run for the State House back. Um, in, in the early 90s was the fact that I didn't have to be a wealthy billionaire to run for or a millionaire or whatever uh, because it was public financing with full disclosure in Minnesota. And if we had a Minnesota model in Washington, D.C., that would be, you know, one, one good start. One of the things that we're working really hard on is called the Disclose Act. Um, we came close to getting that passed under Joe early in Obama's ad administration, uh, and then uh, you know, we, we lost it. And so 
all these it's candidates for the most part if they're doing everything legally are, are listing where all their funding is coming from there's reports that we that we do and you can go on the website and you can look and, and see where, where funding comes from but these super PACs have all this unimaginable protection for who they're giving and who they're advocating for and all that and so I would like us to uh, not at a minimum have them disclosed, you know, because they say, you know, the better America for better apple pie and ice cream, you know, at the end of it. But you have no idea where the money's coming from. And there's so many of these uh, super PACs out there um, that, that are doing that, that are running these distorted ads and that, that we, we need to take our democracy back. And I think public financing would be an ultimate goal of mine because it is something I've supported, a Minnesota model where you raise a third, a third's openly reported, and then in order to get the public financing, you have to sign on the dotted line that you're not gonna spend more than a certain amount. And I, I think we can get there. It's worked pretty good in Minnesota, but even in Minnesota, we're starting to see these super PACs kind of push around the edge on it. And when Minnesota tried to um, do something about that um, through the court system, the court said, well, we really can't regulate these super PACs and we make them disclose. Yes, we can if we pass a law to make them do that. And that, that should be the minimal thing that we do. My name is Ava Fondasso and I live in St. Paul. I would like to thank you for mentioning in your remarks two of the least expensive and most effective government programs that we have, which are the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Not only scholarship like mine at the University of Minnesota, they fund education for democratic self-governance all across the country, and they cost less per year than the security for Trump Tower and Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> we can't defeat terrorism with bombs. We've been trying that this entire millennium so far, but we can defeat it in the contest for ideas because ours are better. So I want to urge you and all my fellow constituents to oppose the job-killing cuts to the NEH and NEA. Good morning. Good morning, Ben. This is uh, my sixth town hall meeting. I've had with you five this year. Um, Thirteen years ago, you were kind of wet and green behind the ears, but I see you a very strong woman right now, and I applaud you for that. I'm very excited to hear you talk about the special investigations of Trump, his associates, his, uh, everything on his taxes. We need that right now. We don't need oversight committees that you talked about 13 years ago when uh, you were talking about uh, possibly impeaching Bush. We need that right now. And folks, Paul Ryan is third in line to be president. <laughs> he can hear from you. You have a right to talk to him and write him letters. And don't forget the vice president. <laughs> They're Pat. all in line. They have a right to hear from you. Don't forget the tax march coming up here on April 15th. Be there. Show your colors. Are you going to be in town for that, by the way? What day of the week is it? April 15th, Saturday. Oh, there's a very good chance it probably am, but I'll have to check my schedule. I'll talk to my staff afterwards and see if I have some morning off. The only other thing I want to say is you talked about the military action. We can't solve our problems with military might. We have been in a constant state of warfare since 1990, on and off. There are estimates that we in the United States are responsible for the deaths of over 20 million people around the world. Maybe that's why some people don't like us. Wake up! Thank you. Well, um, first off, on, on the taxes, in ways and means, um, and maybe I, maybe I can, I can <coughs> tweet this out when they, when, when when they go into session. Every time Ways and Means has been in this uh, meeting, the Democrats have asked the chairman, Chairman Brady of Texas, 
to request um, President Trump's tax forms. The Ways and Means Committee has the power to do that. They have voted this down on a, on a partisan, partisan line all the time. So, so I'm going to get in trouble with the people. So I don't know if I introduced myself. Bob Roland. I'm known by the Jacob Schmidt Brewery. So, that, which is a beautiful reuse of great architecture here in the Twin Cities. Um, going back to the arts, which I will get back to, you, to your comments. So what I would... What I, the point that I was making was we have, Congress has the power to do that without standing up all these investigatory uh, sites. And uh, so the other thing we've been doing is privilege resolutions. We are not going to give up. We are going to keep that drumbeat going. And hopefully, and I know uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues uh, from New Jersey who's been leading the fight on this, Mr. Pasquale, I know he's talked about um, things that might that might be able to happen that week of tax week. So stay tuned. We can do this. Congress can do this like that. And it came apart. Uh, uh, it came to happen because of a little scandal called the Teapot Dome scandal. <laughs> and Congress gave them uh, now has permission to look at you know, taxes for the arts. Um, I I met with uh, the, some of the folks from the Minnesota Council of the Arts and the Humanities together. And um, we will stand firm. I always like to go on the, uh, the House floor of the U.S. Congress and talk about how Minnesota, we collectively, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, went to the ballot box and put in our constitutional amendment that we respected, protected, and embraced and would raise revenue for the arts and for the humanities and for our environment. So I love being able to go down the House floor and say that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lex Landry, and um, I'm from Roseville. And uh, first of all, let me thank you for being one of the only honest politicians these days. <laughs> um, my concern, or I have two, is uh, first of all, I understand your concerns for the Russian hacking, and uh, I personally don't think that we should be putting our time, our money, and our effort into that, and I think there are more pressing problems that we should be focusing on, okay. such as climate change. And uh, I was wondering, what are the uh, leading what are you guys doing, or Congress specifically, doing to help slow down, stop, and prevent climate change? We're related in our quest and our topic, and we're also neighbors. I'm Sharon Coombs from Shoreview, and my question is about climate change as well. But first, I want to thank you for holding these town hall meetings. Not all of your colleagues are doing that with the frequency that you are, and thank you for extending this one today so that I could get ask my question on February. Well, we, we'll thank McAllister again, because you're saying, because he's saying, I got right back here in the way to hero. On February 8th, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson, in a special message to Congress, warned of, quote, a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels, end quote. That same year, the President's Science Advisory Committee warned of warming temperatures and sea level rises. Now while we in Minnesota are enjoying time not spent in snow removal this year, we are experiencing higher food costs due to the drought in California and the excess rains we received here in Minnesota last summer and higher homeowners insurance premiums to cover the costs associated with the more extreme weather that science definitely is tying to climate change now. Um, and also, we have more ticks out, and they're out longer, and they're carrying more diseases. President Johnson's warning was issued 52 years ago, yet Congress still has not acted on climate change. Now, Representative Rick Nolan, when we were meeting with him in D.C. a couple years ago, from northern Minnesota, said that Congress will not act on climate change until big and dark money gets out of politics, and you've talked about the super PACs and publicly funded elections, and this gentleman back here talked about gerrymandering. Those are impediments um, that need to be removed. So, Representative McCullough, my question to you is, what is it going to take to get you and your colleagues in Congress to act on climate change effectively? Um, Representative Nolan, even though he said big and dark money is the huge impediment um, did agree to co-sponsor Citizen Climate Lobby's proposed 
legislation and to talk to Republican colleagues to urge them to do the same. And I'm wondering if you would also do that. Uh, I Thank do that, you. I do that every day. And I did that on Thursday when I sat down. We're doing, we're trying to close up the 2017 appropriations bill. And I had a serious conversation with um, my chairman, Ken Calvert, and the Senate chairwoman, Lisa Murkowski, and Tom Udall, uh, the Democrat sitting next to me. I, I work on this 24 7. And they were cutting the EPA, and they were all the funds that have come out of climate change, the way that they have been, the reason why I introduced the bill that I, that I did to save our science, because they were, they were trying to download, destroy, and bury uh, the information that we had on, on, on climate change. So, um, you know, I, I'm able to do that because folks like you and your organization, which is uh, part of the national movement, is out there encouraging and talking to other people. I can't, you know, I appreciate what Brick said about the dark money, but I don't believe we can't do anything. I am like, how do I politely say, in their face all the time. So I'm going to agree more. And that's why I had the, the, the climate change uh, forum at, at St. Thomas, because in fact, young adults such as yourself, sir, were coming up to me and saying, nobody's talking about the things that are going to impact me over the rest of my lifetime. And climate change is, is, is something you know, if we're going to talk about one good thing that I can I can stand up and hold up in the Department of Defense. If you heard her comment, she used the term sea level rise. And that's how the Department of Defense talks about climate change. <coughs> and they have that down as one of their big national security issues. That if we don't engage and get it right and start reducing the harmful effects of climate change, we are going to see more and more and more conflict happen throughout the world and the Department of Defense, believe it or not, on that is our ally. So thank you. Thank you both. Hi, I'm Paul Herzog from Afton. Uh, I, much of what I wanted to say about health care has been said. So I would hope that the Democratic leadership is talking to President Trump very, very soon. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is there are some of us out here that could really use help with uh, getting school loans paid off. And uh, between Parent Plus and <coughs> my daughters, the loans that they've taken out, it's a, it's a burden. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name's Becky, and I also wanna, was going to talk, use uh, healthcare as one of my examples, but that's been covered fairly well. But my, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was reinforce um, what, and reiterate what Joel said, is that's walking and chewing gum. Having lived through the Bush years, I remember every, all the energy being sucked up by playing defense on programs that people depend on, like we are, seem to be doing now. And I think sometimes that's by design, that they want to keep hitting us with things that are horrible, so that we get all uh, you know, upset about that and stop talking about the actual solutions that you have, that other people have to these um, problems that we have, like healthcare, climate change, et cetera. And so I guess I'm looking for um, you to um, talk about how we can keep engaged on positive, a positive agenda that can be put forward to solve some of the very, very real problems that we have, including uh, income inequality, which leads to the uh, election problems that we have and prevents us from doing something rational about climate change and things like that. So how can you, you've done a great job in communicating with us, particularly on issues that are kind of the issue of the day in, in uh, Washington. So I'm wondering, can we extend that to putting out that, you know, keep, keeping energy around that positive agenda that we can put forward? So. Thank you. Um, first on the student loans, we, we started making some strides on bringing down the cost of student loans under the Obama administration. Uh, some of that was statutorily uh, done. Some of it were things that the administration would do on their own. We're watching like hawks to start seeing if they undo some of the regulations and some of the rules um, that we had um, that uh, kept the cost of uh, student, you know, uh, student loans from getting any higher and trying to bring them down. It, this is a huge problem. I meet with uh, people who, you know, a four-year degree, even a two-year degree, first-time college and families or adults 
who have children that are getting ready to go to college who need to go back and take some classes so that they're at the top of their game and that they can go for the next promotion and that they feel that they've insulated themselves against the next recession. So, um, this, you know, but things like that, to, to your point about talking about income equality, but back to your point, there's all these big pictures that are out there and the media doesn't focus on, on a lot of that. So that, that becomes up to us to work together on how to move, move things forward. And, and so I think you're going to see something, um, some changes, and see here again, I'm kind of limited on how I can talk, and some of what you're talking about almost becomes more on the other side than it is like the congressional and almost becomes somewhat of how we organize and act and activate on the other side. So uh, on, on, on political sides, there's congressional political. So we need to do what we can congressionally, but I also, um, we also will be working on, on, on the other side of it as, as well. Well, I guess, I guess one of the things I was thinking, you talked about sometimes some bills that you have out there, and it's just, uh, I wasn't aware of uh, some of what you talked about, but being aware of it, then we can maybe push those, Certainly. we can activate. So Certainly. just communicating on that well, positive agenda I, that's being put forth. I, I have a limited budget on how I can, on how I can do, so I would encourage all of you, if any of you had an opportunity to put this in, and I know you get bombarded with emails, in fact, I just, you know, I thought, I love Hallmark cards, but I don't need to get their update three times a day. <laughs> so uh, I, I, know, I know how overwhelming that, that can be, but if you would like to sign up for our newsletter, that's where you're going to find when I've dropped a bill and things like that on, um, with all due, due respect to our news media, um, you know, they, they, didn't, they don't cover a lot of the day-to-day -day work that I'm out there doing with, with other people. So uh, signing up on the newsletter would, would be one way which to um, know better about what we're working on and then you can offer suggestions and ideas or community uh, forums or gatherings or meet with my staff on how we can push it out some more on the congressional side. That would be very, um, I, I love your suggestion, um, but, I, and it, it, but you know, it's, I'm limited in, into, uh, you know, if you're not sending a mailer every week or anything like that on what I did. So uh, please sign up for the newsletter. Thank you. Oh, Carol just gave me a note. Okay, we've got a couple people left. And, um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna make her stand over here by herself. Is that okay with the four of you women that, you know? Yeah, we're gonna be a team. So I'm gonna have, as you're coming up to the mic, someone left their phone in the sign-in desk. So check right now. I left mine in the car, so I know it's not mine. <laughs> I hope I left it in the car. So thank you. Thank you for waiting. Hi, um, my name is Angie Robinson. I'm from Roseville. Uh, last summer, my son became extremely ill. He was finally diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's an autoimmune disorder that attacks your intestines. Um, it's, there's no cure, but you can control it. with medications. I have a family member with that. Yeah, so uh, he needs to be on a medication that's administered by IV every eight weeks. And when he was diagnosed, um, it's really important to keep it under control, especially for children, because if you don't, then you can lose parts of your intestine. And it's, you get a colostomy bag, it's very low quality of life. But um, he's doing really well on this drug, but the problem is uh, when we were told he would need it. We were told that it would cost thirty thousand dollars per dose. That's a hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year, and there's no cure. Um, sorry. That's, that's okay. I, we, we had, as I as I shared, I have a family member, so yeah. Okay. So um, my thing is. No healthcare system can withstand that kind of cost. Universal, single payer, it doesn't matter. We have to keep these costs under control. And so what can we do to keep it under control, especially for these pharmaceutical companies that are charging $30,000? You know, 
the EpiPen? Oh my gosh. And, um, you know, for women, um, birth control, the same formula for birth control pills now cost, you know, exponentially more than they did before. I mean, we need, we need to bring the insurance uh, companies and the pharmaceutical companies to the table. Healthcare is a right, but it's not a right to gouge, and it's not a right for extreme profit for a corporation. talking about preventative care and you know wanting to cut the preventative care. Crohn's disease is a very autoimmune diseases are very, very tricky to diagnose. And I'm I'm sorry that your son has has this because I have, as I mentioned, people and I have friends who live with Crohn's. Um, and it's it's gonna be really tough, especially for a younger person because it's hard for an adult to get their head around it. Um, but if we, if we get rid of cancer screenings and preventative checks and doctors being able to refer on up the chain to find some of this stuff, we're going to have a lot of people with um, chronic diseases and, and, and problems that if we don't catch them early enough, there won't be the kind of innovation or as you mentioned, your son, I, you know, dealing with a colostomy bag as a teenager would, would be a very, very hard thing to do. It's hard for adults to do. So thank you for sharing such a personal story, and, and um, we can do so much better than we do with the pharmaceutical companies. We absolutely can, and it's a huge failure that we don't negotiate for best price. And we can start at a minimum there, and then we need to do oversight, and then the, there's patent protection, there's all kinds of things that the Congress has enabled pharmaceutical companies to get away with so that they can continue to inflate their prices. And to me, it's morally bankrupt. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Mimi Jennings. I'm a former public school teacher. I taught at Central High School for 30 years. Um, um, so two things about me before my question. One is I went on an NEH travel grant to West Africa in the summer of 93. And thence forward, I was able to bring Africa to um, French-speaking Africa to my French classroom. It made a huge difference. Um, the other thing is I'm a part of the international movement that is called Transition Towns. Uh, there are many transition communities throughout the Twin Cities. We don't do advocacy per se. We do strong communities and face private uh, climate change together. We're starting to add, add the advocacy piece. Um, but know that there's going to be a national Transition Town Conference here in this room, July 27th. Um, now, <laughs> um, all of the things we've been talking about, we're in a kind of a panic state because the strategy of the Trump administration is to put forth its stuff at a rapid pace. And it also includes the stuff about no hearings. Um, and yet you say that it is a fact that he has been, his con, he has invited <coughs> hacking into his, or at least it is a fact that the campaign has been hacked by Russia. If that's the case, we have an illegitimate president to whose agenda we are responding. There are petitions out right now who say, stop, stop. Do not respond to an illegitimate president, or at least one who has not been legitimized. First things first. Would you welcome any kind of movement like that? I'm taking two questions. Yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, my name. I didn't know you were two different questions. I can't read your mind, but okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Two. My name is Patty Carroll, and I have a 20 year old son who suffered permanent brain damage after receiving seven vaccines in one day. And so for the past 15 years, I have been involved in vaccine safety issues and informed consent. Um, I currently serve as the director of outreach for the Vaccine Safety Council of Minnesota, and I am on the executive leadership team of a national nonprofit called Health Choice 
which is dedicated to um, trying to figure out what, why so many American children are sick. Um, last month I was in DC and I invited you um, to attend a congressional <coughs> briefing that was put on by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Robert De Niro um, regarding the lack of science, um, true science, honest science on vaccine safety. And unfortunately, you didn't um, send anybody and you did not attend. But um, what I'm wondering is if you could consider meeting with some of us um, and if you would support uh, Trump's uh, appointment of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to an independent vaccine safety review board. Um, we have a whistleblower at the CDC, um, Dr. William Thompson, came forward two and a half years ago, um, got a whistleblower attorney and turned over 10,000 pages of documents to Congress, um, admitting that he and his fellow researchers committed blatant fraud in a vaccine safety study designed to determine whether earlier administration of the MMR vaccine would, had, a, had a correlation with autism. They found that, hey, yes. Hey, 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 oh, no, we're not doing that here. Okay, thank you. They okay. found that, yes, the, the initial data showed that there was a very strong correlation between earlier administration of MMR and autism. The strongest correlation being in African American boys. But what they did was... I, I'm way over my time, so if you could... I mean, I got, I got your question, if you could wrap up. Okay, so, okay, so well, I, I, I'm I, giving I, a signal from other I sent this information to you, and several groups have sent this to you, to sure. your office. I sure. actually dropped it off. So what I'm wondering is, will you support uh, Representative Posey in an investigation of the CDC whistleblower? Um, the OGR committee is working right now to depose Dr. Thompson and get him, he, he wants to actually testify before Congress. Um, look into the broader pattern of fraud in HHS's autism oversight, and there's two specific uh, bills, legislation that you could support on vaccine safety and parental rights. One of them is HR 2618, the proposal for an independent vaccine safety agency, which I mentioned, and HR 1636, which is a bill that would um, compare health outcomes of children who were completely unvaccinated versus those who were fully vaccinated on the U.S. schedule. Thank you. I won't comment on legislation right now, but we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll have my office look into what's going on with the whistleblowers. We work with whistleblowers a lot at EPA and that, so thank you. Okay. And um, with these congressional hearings, as you know, all the, all the groups in town, and sometimes when you get the invites and everything else, you just can't make it. But I want you to rest assured, when I have information in the office, it doesn't, it, it, gets, it gets handled by a senior staffer. So we'll get, we'll, we'll get back to you. Great, so, I appreciate um, it. So what should date that, that you're here again? What, what day are you here again? January 27th, National, uh, January? Uh, July 27th, well that was just to remind you. Um, <laughs> See, just, you were listening. Yes, the 27th of July for four days. Um, here, we're, I mean, we're gonna take over McAllister. They're fabulous, you're right, they're fabulous hosts. Um, we'll see if we can. So we'll have workshops and then, yeah, and it's all on positive uh, 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 confrontation to climate change together. That is that, the diversity piece really being together. Good. That sounds really good, and, and 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 I'll see what we can do to to, to monitor your activities. Thank you for sharing. So we have our last two people up here, and um, thank you so much for standing for so long. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm from um, you know, earlier this week, the, um, it was discovered that the EPA colluded with Monsanto um, and that, um, you know, Monsanto, we have so much glyphosate in the environment. We have two independent researchers, Anthony um, Samsel and um, Stephanie Seneff, have found glyphosate in vaccines. Um, this is a regulatory <coughs> agency. 
um, who is overseeing a regulatory agency. Um, as the person before me pointed out, we actually have two CDC whistleblowers currently. Um, one is Dr. William Thompson, and the other is a group called Spider. Um, and I want to make sure that you know two and a half years don't pass again then we don't do anything about it because people are getting really um, fed up with having glyphosate absolutely riddled everywhere. And you know, the World Health Organization declared in 2015 that glyphosate is a probable carcinogen. Six months later, the EPA raises the safety limits for glyphosate. And um, you know, we can't continue you know, in this direction and have weed killer in our vaccines. It's just, it's, it's not sustainable. Thank you for sharing that. Like, like I said, I work with, with uh, whistleblowers and we have people who are coming forward with some of the cuts and, 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 and how that's going to impact some of the research and science that needs to be done. So we'll look into that as, as I mentioned earlier, I have some oversight responsibility with the EPA. So, so thank you and we'll get focused on it and we'll check in with the Government Oversight Committee, which would be on the appropriator side so do those hearings. They, they would do it. So. Jason Chavis and I sometimes are in the elevator together. Now you give me something to talk about. So thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Leah Tassa Damon. I'm from St. Paul. And uh, this administration is trying to pursue a very white nationalist, very racist immigration policy in regards to what they're encouraging ICE to do and also in regards with what they're trying to do to limit legal immigration into this country and to make it an inhospitable place for um, people from outside the US. And I'm wondering what Congress is able to do. Like, I understand a lot of that is under the purview of the executive branch, but I'm wondering what Congress is able to do to try, try to uphold American ideals about being a welcoming place for the world. Thank you. Thank you. So many of us, along with you, spoke up and, uh, and were disturbed when the first immigration ban came through. The second one's now going through through four challenges in that. Um, the um, comments that, that the Bush administration, we haven't seen their final budget yet, is going to do to really, uh, excuse me, um, <laughs> the immigration, we could have done it under Bush. Um, he, was, he was ready to work with us and then, and then the Republicans um, stopped. So if this immigration issue could have been solved under the Bush administration is what I meant to say. Now we've got the Trump administration of one in. And the whole issue about sanctuary cities or cities that um, uh, like, like St. Paul, that allow our law enforcement to know that they can freely go in the community and have conversations if it's domestic violence or gang violence and that, and get the information that they need to make us all safer. And then President Trump uh, is out there saying, well, we are going to cut off the funding. Uh, our police department has a role to play, and that's being, you know, to protect and serve uh, people in, in, here in, in St. Paul or in surrounding communities. Not to, not to be the enforcers for, for ICE and immigration. And some of the things that we're hearing about that some of my colleagues uh, had uh, in, in the Democratic caucus, they invited <coughs> the Secretary of um, Homeland Security over and talked about how children are now being separated from their parents at the, at the detention centers. I mean, can you imagine, um, we're talking about toddlers being ripped out of their arms with their mothers, and I'm not kidding. I'm not being overly graphic saying that. Um, that's not who we are in America. Um, and then uh, the, the ban, uh, when you look at the list of, of countries, it is a cherry-picked countries that it appears that uh, the Bush family has no relationships with who are Muslim countries. That, I mean, doing it again. <laughs> that's what happens when you fly in and get in at 11 o'clock at night and get up at 6. Um, so we've got, we've got our work cut out for holding, holding them. Um, and I'm very concerned about, about the tone of, of the Trump administration. I'm very concerned um, you know, with, with Mr. Bannon being there and other people that being there with previous statements uh, he made and, and his work with his, his media organization. I'm very alarmed by it. Um, so what, we're, what we've been doing is we've been bringing in uh, the agency's heads from Homeland Security and we've been turning up the heat and asking tough questions and demanding to have transparency and honest answers. And stay tuned to what happens to cities like St. Paul, Minneapolis, LA, New York, and cities all around that support our local law enforcement, saying you do your job first, you do it well, and you know how to follow the law. You see a law being broken, and you have to do, 
take the next step on. So thank you for your question. As you can tell, I'm tired. Coming, getting up early. I want to thank you all for your attentiveness, but I want to thank you all again for making yesterday happen. Sure. It would not have happened without you. We have a lot more work to do. We have work in, in uh, immigration reform, as was just pointed out, work on the budget, work on making sure that military spending it makes sense and is not ir irrational, just, and to make sure that, well, first and foremost, that we build upon the success that we had yesterday in putting forward a solid proposal and asking moderate Republicans, people all across the United States to help us go to the White House to say, we can get this right, we can get health care right for the American people. Thank you very much.